Hi, Arlena. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you. It is such a treat to connect with you here because you're a seasoned podcast host, um, but we also met through the To Be Magnetic community. So to have to connect with someone who understands spirituality, manifestation, and maybe how alcohol or the foods we consume can affect our ability to be clear and allow us to connect with the vibration of the things we want to attract to our life. Yeah. So interesting. We were talking about vibration. It's alcohol plays such a big part in whether we're able to connect with our feelings or not. So it'll, it'll, this will be a really interesting, I think it'll be educational. I'm not, I'm not trying to villainize, you know, alcohol consumption or, but I just feel like the more information that we have, the better. And I, I love this idea that we can utilize these tools that are available to us, like manifestation tools. And, um, there are certain things that help it and certain things that hinder it. So why not give ourselves the best chance to utilize these tools to the maximum capacity? And as someone who talks a lot about food and vibration, people often ask me, do I consider alcohol a high vibration or a low vibration food? And I think with everything, it's quality, right? So there are a variety of different qualities of alcohol on the market these days. And if we just focus on wine, right, there's wine that's made with lowest quality ingredients possible. So genetically modified grapes, you know, water that has fluoride in it, um, added ingredients to make it ferment faster, which causes a lot of the allergic reactions we see nowadays versus wine from a 300 year old, you know, grapevine that is, is grown with filtered water or, you know, on land that is very much loved and respected by the people who own it, who make it in a traditional, traditional way. It truly is naturally fermented. It's aged for many years before it's sold. It's, it's, you know, two complete dichotomies when it comes to wine. So for people that are tuning in, usually listening to information about vibration and food, um, you know, not all alcohol is alike, not just like not all food is alike. Um, so I just wanted to give that little, that little tidbit out there for people to consider w- what we're kind of going into, but, um, oh, I, you're going to hate what I have to say. Oh, no, 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 Tell me, tell me, go for it. Jump right in. Um, so, it's so funny, you know, we're talking about different, you know, adding fluoride and, filtered water and, you know, the age and the soil and stuff. Um, But it doesn't really change the chemical composition of alcohol. And and, and certainly, um, you know, when we're talking about being sensitive to what we're putting into our body, if we're going to be so sensitive that we're looking at things like whether the wine has filtered water or fluoride or whatever, um, let's just focus on what's really important, which is that it's, um, it's ethanol alcohol, which is actually when ingested, it turns into poison, right? It kicks off a variety of chemical reactions within your body that you, you know, you're literally putting poison in your body. And it's, it's funny to me to hear people dress it up like, oh, there's good ethanol alcohol and there's bad ethanol alcohol. Um, your body doesn't see the difference between, um, you know, filtered water, wine, like there's no difference. You know, your body will process ethanol alcohol the same way. And there is a couple of interesting things I don't think that people realize when they're ingesting alcohol is that it's both fat soluble and water soluble. So that means that it actually can permeate every cell of your body. And when we talk about fat soluble, um, we're talking about cells like um, the neural ganglia in your brain, right? It's it's, uh, coated with something called a myelin sheath, which is like a fatty, Uh, fatty substance. And so because alcohol can permeate fat cells, it actually damages um, over time. There was a study done in the UK. They did, they studied 35,000 people and in sort of middle age who are drinking, would would be considered moderate drinkers, one to two on average. So that could mean uh, 14 drinks on the weekend. It could mean you know, two drinks a day could mean seven drinks on Friday and Saturday night. 
but th that's what we're looking at. And so across the board, there is a decline in um, that myelin sheath around the um, the neural ganglia cells. Um, so it's actually, you know, I guess like a, a inflammatory way to talk about it would be say it causes brain damage, <laughs> it's, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, when we talk in terms of like, I think that it's an important question to ask, is a little bit of alcohol actually good for you, right? Because there is a lot of that messaging in mainstream media is a little bit good for you. Um, and across the board, the answer, if we're look, just looking at it from a biological, scientific, uh, the data is all showing that there is no amount that's actually good for you. People like to dress it up and say that, you know, I've heard all kinds of claims, but I feel that messaging is coming from a place of fear, uh, coming from a place of people don't want to let go of something that brings pleasure to them. And there's there's this idea of rationalization and justification for some of these behaviors. And it comes out as, well, let's discredit the information. Whereas this, you know, there's that whole critical line of thinking because I, I think people don't actually want to hear. Maybe they do. Maybe I think people um, in your world are, they probably care. Uh, like if someone's going to be in this health space and want to practice, you know, um, law of attraction and manifestation, I think they actually do care. And maybe they just don't realize, you know, the impact alcohol is actually having on their physical body, let alone their emotional or spiritual side. It affects, it affects all of it. And I just wanted to throw in one more thing that's both physical and emotional, which is something that people don't talk a lot about is initially when people ingest alcohol, sometimes people do it to relax. And I like to frame all these conversations around everything has a cost, right? So initially you, you might be able to take that glass of wine in and, and initially relax. That is true. But what ends up happening is alcohol affects your hormonal uh, circuits and your neural circuits. So in a way that it affects your adrenal glands and it actually raises the baseline of your cortisol, which is that stress hormone. So it raises the baseline when you're not drinking. And so I think that's something that people might want to be aware of. It's like, you know, oh, I just take it to relax. But what you're doing on the back end, everything has a cost, right? So you pay the price later. So it's just, you, you know, pay the price if you want to. I mean, it's, you know, do what you want to do, but it's, it's just like, let's just do it with some awareness. That's really interesting that it raises your cortisol levels. Yeah. It raises and the baseline. Yeah. When you're not drinking. So I stopped drinking many years ago simply because I noticed every time I drank, it made me crave foods that I wouldn't normally eat. So oh, it made me, crave, made me crave sugar. Um, and then I stopped as well, just because I didn't like that. It made me crave sugar. I didn't like that. It made me gain weight because it changed my cravings. So it changed my food habits. I yeah. didn't like that. It took a day or two away from my life. <laughs> yeah. like, right. I couldn't just have no. one glass of wine or one drink and get up the next day and go about my life in the same way. It yeah. took energy and time and clarity away. And then as I developed a real strong spiritual practice and started to lean into my natural gifts of my psychic abilities and mediumship abilities, mm -hmm. I realized I actually can't use my natural gifts. If there's alcohol in my system, the, it, the machine doesn't work. Right. Yeah. So that's why I stepped away and, you know, maybe like every year or two, like I'll have a nice glass of wine or someone's yeah. drug me to a winery in another country. I'll <laughs> lean in and have a glass, yeah. but I know, I know how my body's going to react. And it's like, I have to schedule that there's going to be time that I'm going to be offline. I'm so curious when the, the cravings for sugar, did you also have cravings for carbohydrates too? I don't, I don't remember. 
Um, okay. So like I wanted to stop quitting alcohol in my early 20s. Oh, I okay. really didn't like how it made me feel, but I really struggled socially when I wouldn't drink. Mm-hmm. People wouldn't want to hang out with me. They wouldn't invite me out. Terrible. People started to cut me out of their lives. Like when I was 28, 29, 30, because, oh, we can't invite Whitney. She's not going to drink with us at the bar, the party. Um, so, you know, so I, I would go. Do they not know forth. you're like a built-in designated? <laughs> no, isn't that funny? Um, I guess they'd rather call a cab, but it was specifically the sugar cravings. Yeah. And um, and that would always lead to weight gain. So yeah. I cut it out first for vanity purposes. Um, yeah. I would love to know from you since you've interviewed almost 300 people on your podcast and you've been sober since, you know, I believe 1994. Yeah. Um, when you connect with people, what is it, what's the range that are causing them to cut alcohol out, out of their life? So it's so interesting. Um, I'm definitely a 12 step advocate, but it's certainly not the only way to stop drinking if that's what you want to do. Um, but the, the women I typically connect with are, I, I, I seem to be the doctor whisperer. (laughs) I have a lot of, a lot of doctors and, um, executives that are high performing right? So doctors that are doing surgery, they want to be at their best the next day or, um, you know, they, but it is often a coping mechanism to, um, to stress, whether you're a business executive or a doctor or, you know, it could be anybody really moms with like a lot of responsibilities, not a lot of support, you know, it just kind of, it just kind of depends. But um, it's not necessarily the person that you would think. It's not necessarily somebody who falls into the category of alcoholic, right? Um, Addiction is actually a spectrum, right? And it goes from, you know, very mild, low grade where people, their lives are still manageable. Things are going relatively well. You know, they haven't lost a lot of stuff or they haven't had a lot of consequences, but then it starts to, but addiction is um, progressive and gets worse over time. And then at the other end of the spectrum are people who are like institutionalized, whether it be, um, you know, a mental health facility or incarcerated because of, you know, drunk related, drunk driving accidents or some, I've, I've seen, I've seen the gamut over the 29 years I've been in the sober space, but, um, It just really depends. And I think what's so encouraging is that people who are really, I feel like there's a change in our society where people are becoming more and more aware of things like the manifestation practices and a new way of being spiritual. Like people are getting away from, you know, you know, not, um, you know, like away from like traditional, like religion and getting more into spirituality and, you know, people are you know, stopping sooner, realizing there's other ways, but it's like these high performers, people want to get the most out of life and they're recognizing that alcohol, it's an anchor. It's, it's not, it's not the, um, it doesn't do for you what it should or what you think it does, but it's so our, we are so convinced as a society that, um, it, I mean, alcohol is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's it's even at church. I, I mean, for heaven's sakes, like I know some people, like I've worked with some women who had very serious alcohol issues and uh, would go to church and, and drink wine at church. And it's like, don't they have a grape juice alternative <laughs> for some of y'all? But um I mean, it's, it's literally everywhere. And it's the only drug that you have to explain why you don't use it, you know, and it's, you know, the, all the marketing from the alcohol companies or, you know, the mommy wine culture is really big and everywhere you go. I mean, I was at the airport, uh, not too long ago and in the gift shop, it was, there's all these, all these, um, aprons with, oh, it's wine o'clock and just all the stuff is just everywhere. And when you were talking about being excluded socially, you know, that's a real concern. It's like, we need to belong. We need to have some kind of tribe and community and to be excluded is a very painful experience. Um, but the good news is because there is such this, 
you know, we're, you know, I, I think when this re is released, we'll be in, in the middle of, or towards the end of, you know, dry January. That wasn't a thing like five years ago. Like, so no booze November and, and dry January, like those weren't, that wasn't a thing. So it's so encouraging to me that people are, you know, sort of, there's this idea that alcoholism is like an elevator and you can get off at any floor. You don't have to wait till you reach the basement. You know, you can get off at any time. And I feel like people are starting to get off sooner and sooner because they're realizing it's hindering their optimal performance, which is what a lot of people are interested in nowadays, it seems like. I like that people see that you can get off the elevator anytime. I think anytime. that's a huge change. And I think that's what's really neat about dry January is it gives a lot of people, you know, people the way I used to be, it gives them an opportunity to take the month off from drinking yeah. without feeling guilty and without yeah. being excluded. So I would love some tips if you have any for people that are really loving how they're feeling in the month of January without drinking and they want to continue that way, but they're not quite sure how they can continue to connect with friends on a Friday or Saturday without also, you know, having a drink with them. Yeah. You know, it's kind of controversial, but there are lots of non-alcoholic options nowadays. You know, that was never my, I did you know, when I, when I quit drinking in 94, you know, people would say, you know, I don't, I don't do fake heroin. So why would I drink fake alcohol? <laughs> you know, I was like, what's the point? And I was like, yeah, what's the point? But, um, I have heard from several people that having that non-alcoholic glass of wine, I think they're even making like non-alcoholic tequila and gin and all that stuff. Um, so that people can feel like they're participating without the negative consequences of the actual alcohol. Right. So I, th I think that's really interesting, but it's so it's what else is really exciting is, I don't know if exciting is the right word, but it gives me hope that people, once we start having real conversations with people, um, you know, about not drinking, it is okay. it's okay for your friend group to shift a little because one of two things will happen. Your relationships will um, evaporate or they will deepen, but they won't stay the same, right? And it's like, what are we doing here? It's like, what do you want out of life? Are we on the same page? Are we, can we support each other, you know, on our, in our goals and in our lifestyles? And if people can't support you, if they're not for you, then it's okay to release with love. It doesn't even, it doesn't have to be a hateful thing. And there are so many people who are on this path of trying to, and I'm not saying change who we are. I'm saying we're sort of evolving and growing, right? Which is different than you know, wanting to change from a place of I'm not good enough, right? We're growing and evolving, which is, which is normal and natural and healthy and, and you're supposed to change, right? So I, I would suggest even offer this idea of like an invitation to start cultivating, you know, they say we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So being in, like, this is a great time of year to be intentional about who do you want to spend your time with? And I would say it's, it's a worthy endeavor to surround yourself with people who are going in the same direction as you are. Beautifully said and great reminders. And yeah. I think we've come a long way. Like I know we've come a long way in the past 20 years from me not being that social with alcohol. It's a lot easier to spend time with friends on a Friday or a Saturday night that don't want to drink. It's so much yeah. more popular. Um, I have a question for you. If I, I yeah. um, interviewer can't help, I can't help myself. Um, but when you, uh, don't you find that like when you are in this place of change, it's kind of lonely at first, mm -hmm. right? Like sometimes the spiritual path and the path of growth is, is kind of lonely, but I mean, that's, it's been a while since you made that transition. So mm -hmm. have you found your people? Have you regretted your decision or regretted the loss of those people who sort of left you out because you weren't drinking? I don't regret that at all, because if they wanted to continue to hang out with me, they could have called me for a coffee or a walk 
or yeah. a yoga class yeah. or a great dinner on a Saturday night that just didn't include wine pairings. Like there's yeah. so many ways to hang out with people. Yeah. It doesn't have to be over drinks. Now, the tough thing was, you know, the majority of time when I really started not drinking that much, you know, I was in my late twenties and now mm -hmm. I'm in my early forties. So I don't know, maybe it affected my ability to, you know, meet someone or, you know, maybe it, it took away some really fun nights I could have had with friends, but I feel great. And I think I gained years back on my physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental health <laughs> that other people my age didn't because they continued to go out drinking. Um, yeah. So I, I, overall, more benefits than negatives. I'm just really grateful for where the world is now because yeah. it's so easy to reach out to a friend and see if they want to do something on a Friday or Saturday night. Yeah. And uh, I think now people who know me, they're like, sweet, I want to hang out with Whitney because I don't have to drink, you know, <laughs> right? Um, like, Phew. You know, and, yeah. Um, and yeah, and that's why I wanted to connect on this topic in January for those that are really feeling good, are really clear on the life they want to create for themselves in 2024. Yeah. And I think a big portion of creating a magnetic, full, happy life is by managing how often you check out and alcohol allows you to check out. It's, yeah. It's, I think, oh, go ahead. I just, I totally, I just wanted to speak to that because it's normal and natural and appropriate to need it. Like what we're talking about is we need to rest. We, we, there, there is an actual need. We do need to check out sometimes, but there's ways to check out that doesn't have a heavy price tag. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I will, I am hanging on to my Netflix. <laughs> I, I will occasionally been on Netflix or I'll even, you know, scroll TikTok. I, I'm on the crafty side of TikTok. So that's kind of in the, I love the yoga and the crafty stuff. And, in the comedy side. And that's, that's fine. You can still self soothe because the truth of the matter is, is our world is a very stressful place. Nobody's going to argue that. Right. And so if you're sort of dabbling in this alcohol free lifestyle, one of the number thing, number one things I would suggest is finding a way to learn how to manage stress. Right. So I do have a guide. It's called how to quit drinking 30 tips for your first 30 days. And and there's, there's things like how to clean up your environment to prepare. There's, you know, how to avoid cravings and then what to do if you have one, but things that you can do to elevate your mood. Like I have, I have an empowerment playlist on my phone that I listen to. If I notice that the first thing is noticing, right. That I'm feeling disconnected or my energy isn't right. I use music. Music is, there is like a zero cost to that right? It's, it's a, it's a great mood elevator, um, moving my body. I love yoga. I went to, you know, hot yoga with my husband this morning. That was really cool. Um, but sometimes I'll just do a quick 10 minute. I think there's a yoga with Adrian. She's really popular on, on YouTube. Um, just something in my, and then, and I am not above having a, a little dance party all by myself in my office. <laughs> you know, it's just something to feel silly and get my body moving. There's this idea that mood follows action, right? So a lot of, if people want to continue the sober alcohol-free lifestyle, a lot of times what we're talking about is, uh, mood management. Right. So we need to learn how to address the negative feelings that come up. And I'm not suggesting that we spiritual bypass and skip over them. There is an appropriate time to feel your feelings, process them to resolution as opposed to uh, skipping over them. Uh, my favorite tool for that is Tara Brock has a meditation on YouTube. It's called the rain meditation. It stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. And it's like 10 minutes. It's actually, 11 minutes and 31 seconds to be specific, but it's a way to acknowledge and honor your feelings and, and help them process to resolution so that you can move on. So that you're not dwelling on it and you're also not bypassing. 
So there's a lot of mood management. Um, I, as you were talking about before, you know, in the TBM community, there's it's imp- community is so important. They mm-hmm. say that, you know, like alcoholism is a disease of isolation and connection is the cure right? It's empathy. Brene Brown was talking about how empathy is the antidote to shame, right? And we all bump into that here and there, whether it's conscious or subconscious, we are all wrestling with some degree of shame and empathy comes through community. Sometimes it's family and friends, but sometimes it's extended community too. It's, it's so important to surround yourself with those people who you can just check in with. I had a friend one time, I would call her and complain about my then boyfriend and be like, Bobby did this and he did that. And she'd be like, well, let's talk about you. <laughs> what's, what's yours? She'd be, she would say to me, um, do you want to just vent or do you want some feedback? And nobody had ever asked me that before. So it's nice to have people in your life who will ask you, Cause sometimes it's like, I need to vent first and then you can give me feedback because ultimately I do want to alter my behavior so that I don't continue to create problems. Like all I can control is my behavior. And, and so I want to give myself the best chance at a good relationship by controlling my own behavior. So yeah, this community is really important and mood management and things like that. Those are, but there's, I have lots of tips for you if you want to. (laughs) <laughs> Check out the guide. Well, you mentioned one thing, alcohol cravings, and that's something I've actually never experienced. So, but I'm sure some of the listeners maybe have where they actually crave alcohol. They crave the cocktail. They crave the glass of wine. How can they manage those cravings and make different choices? Yeah. So cravings don't have to be like an addictive craving. It's like a lot of people crave it at, um, rest at a restaurant, or we like to call it the witching hour, which is like the, when you get home from work and you're, you're at the lowest point when it comes to, um, internal willpower, willpower is actually a finite resource. It's something that you use throughout the day. That's why a lot of times in productivity, um, classes, they'll say, do the hard things first save the, your willpower for the hard things first, because at the end of the day, you kind of run out, but that is when people start to crave alcohol. They just need that glass of wine. Their defenses are, are low. They're stressed out. So there's two ways to approach it. So making sure that your environment doesn't have any alcohol is one way to prevent giving into cravings. But, um, oddly enough, protein, is a really good, like having, um, like a protein bar. Sometimes I would carry one in my purse just for the end of the day, you know, like we all need to get, like, I haven't drank in a really long time, but I still need to get stuff done at the end of the day. Like I have a family and there's lots of whole, you know, like you're an entrepreneur, you get it. Um, so I protein at the end of the day, like lots of water, but protein specifically will help build, like rebuild your emotional, uh, support system, your internal support system, um, having alternatives, like a treat, like everybody deserves a little treat at the end of the day. So if you have something to look forward to, you know, I, I dare say, I, you know, I hate to say sugar cause I know we're not, <laughs> we're trying to, we're trying to be good. But, um, in the beginning, when you're coming off of alcohol and you're, you know, there is a peer, a, a dip period, where you actually might feel worse with some people when they get off, when they stop drinking alcohol, actually feel worse for a little while. And that's for a couple of reasons, because your dopamine reward circuit has been flooded with so much um, artificial dopamine that your, your dopamine receptors, think of your um, cell as a circle with little funnels on the outside. And those are the receptors that bring in the dopamine into the cell that gives you that good feeling. Well, if you constantly are uh, flooding it with too much, it actually does something called a um, receptor uptake. So it um, actually removes a certain number of funnels from the surface. So you actually have to have more alcohol to have that same effect. And so when you stop drinking alcohol, healing is the period of time that your body needs to put those receptors back out. So it takes a little bit of time. So a lot of times people early in recovery, 
will have cravings because what they're actually feeling is the, their body is actually healing and it feels, it does not feel good. Like you don't feel as happy. You're like, life feels a little flat. You might experience a little boredom. And so that could be interpreted as a craving. It's actually just boredom, right? So things like filling your evening with something self-soothing, a bath, a, a different kind of treat, whether it's food, you know, that's just like a, a temporary, it's like a stopgap measure that you could eventually get off of that too. But um, the, the alcohol is, is, is very powerful. And so healing from that is, it's a thing and it takes a little bit of time. So just know that you might feel worse before you feel better. And, and when you feel bad, that's, is what's going to trigger the craving. So it's important to have some treats to treat yourself, especially gently in the evening at the end of the day. And um, yeah, that's sort of like the preventative side. Is that why at AA meetings they're famous for their cookies and their <laughs> caffeine? Is because they know that um, that you need a little treat to transition? Do you know um, what's funny is uh, meetings started. So Bill and Bob are the two guys that founded Alcoholics Anonymous and their wives are the ones who would bring, you know, they would have started out having meetings at homes and it sort of became this tradition where, you know, it's customary that when you have guests, you put out coffee and cookies, you know, you, you know, yeah. it's, it's just kind of customary. You know, this started in Akron, Ohio. And I believe this is just my opinion, um, that it was just customary that it kind of became this thing that sort of took on a life of its own. And back in the day, there were no spin dries, we call them no detox facilities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, people would come in, in active DTs, delirium tremens when they were, their hands would be shaking. They're actively withdrawing from alcohol and people used to give out candy, candy bars, because that would help the DTs. And so there became this link between um, coming off about detoxing off of alcohol and giving people sugar. So I think it was, it was kind of twofold that it became like, there's all these traditions in 12 step meetings um, that are not um, listed in the actual literature. Like there's nowhere in the literature that you're going to find provide coffee and cookies like that. Or that's, <laughs> that's not in the, that's not on the list. Well, when you and I were talking previously, you had talked about the link between self-esteem and alcoholism. I was curious about that because self-esteem seems to be, or the lack of it, seems to be kind of the root cause of so much of a person's lack when they're trying to move out of a space. It always seems to come back to self-esteem and self-worth. Can you shed some light on how that plays a role in our drinking habits or alcoholism? Yeah, that's a big question. I'm going to, you'll have to, you might have to rein me in on this one because I'm so passionate about it because alcohol is a symptom of a deeper problem. Alcohol is just a symptom, right? It's, and it comes, I just have so much compassion because I understand that typically people develop maladaptive coping skills because they have pain, right? And they don't know how to self-soothe or resolve the pain. And what happens in childhood is like we have, a, um, you know, a lot of people grow up in dysfunctional homes. You know, m most people experience some level of, of dysfunction. And so people develop maladaptive coping skills. And so this isn't about blaming people who suffer with alcoholism. It's an acknowledgement that when they were young, they had pain and didn't know how to resolve it. And so when people show up to, you know, with an addiction issue, um, you know, what they're really showing up with is internal pain that they've dissociated from. Like one of the maladaptive coping skills is dissociation. It's actually... Uh, there to protect you. It's like your brain has this mechanism that it's able to dissociate pain. But the problem with dissociation is that the pain doesn't go away. It waits. Mm -hmm. Time does not heal all wounds. The pain waits. Mm -hmm. And typically it waits for when we have, when we are stronger and when we have love and support, and then the pain arises so that it can be processed to resolution. But what happens, the reason why self-esteem is so, um, such a pivotal 
key to recovery is that um, I have come to understand that we only allow into our lives what we believe we deserve on this subconscious level, right? And if you want to know what you believe you deserve, take a look at your surroundings, take a look at your body, your relationships. They are, people are just a, ref- like when I, whenever he, I, we all have girlfriends who have bad boyfriends, And what they're saying is they are simply a reflection of what they believe they deserve, right? It has nothing to do with the guy. Like I never, when someone comes to me about relationship issues, I never address the man. It's why do you feel that you deserve this? And when we work on the self-esteem, those types of relationships naturally fall away. Like we don't even have to talk about him because when you, when you understand that you deserve love and compassion and, and to be treated well, those things just fall away. And so self-esteem is really at the core, what do I believe I deserve? And when we ingest alcohol, one of the things that happens to us on a biological level is that the prefrontal cortex is relaxed, meaning it inhibits our impulse control. So we tend to say and do things we wouldn't normally do. And they say that it's the truth serum. That's not actually true because we all have intrusive thoughts, as people like to call it now. We all have those thoughts. But then we think it through and we realize, oh, I don't really feel that way. But it's the pure impulse. I mean, we have, people have dark impulses, but we don't act on them, right? Yeah. And we know this to be true because everybody drives and we... <laughs> you know, like we, we, we know how to behave, right? We, you can get mad, but you feel yes. the anger, but you don't actually act on it, right? That's impulse control. And to say that it's a true serum would be like saying that you would act on your negative impulses when you're driving. Of course not. Of course you wouldn't do that. But when you're ingesting alcohol, that goes to sleep. And sometimes people actually do act on their impulses. So it's not a true serum. But what happens is we behave badly and then we assign a moral meaning to ourselves Mm -hmm. as if um, when we're sober and are thinking at our best, we would behave that way because we don't. When we're sober, we don't behave the same way we do when we're, when we're drinking, but we assign a moral meaning to ourselves. Like, like I'm a bad person. Listen, that's the G rated version, right? Like I, you know, some internal dialogue is worse than others. And some are vicious. Some are savage. We tear ourselves down. So we start, if we do make this same mistake over and over again, we begin to believe that we are not good people. We don't deserve good things. And self-esteem is really about identity, right? And so getting sober is about developing a new identity. It's, it's a new identity. It's like, who am I really? Mm-hmm. And, and this is a great time of year to be asking these questions. Who am I really? Who do I want to be? And what would that person do? It's like, what kind of character traits? I don't like to do resolutions, but I like to talk about character traits. What character traits do I want to embody? And then what would that person do today? And this isn't about being your best future self. I think oftentimes your best future self is just you without the maladaptive coping skills, without the internal critical dialogue. It's, it's the true, it's being who you truly are without those things. It's a shedding. It's not a gaining. Although we do grow and evolve, it's not, we're not asking you to be somebody other than who you really are which is good. That's so beautiful and perfect advice for this new year. I really appreciate it. So for people that have been taking advantage of the quote unquote dry January, and they are really amazed by how good they feel. um, What any, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how their physical, emotional, and spiritual bodies are going to continue to prove, improve as they abstain from alcohol, you know, for 20, 30, 40 days and longer. What can you know, they expect? Yeah. So I love to give the analogy of tiny changes, like 
people are making tiny changes and they may not recognize that they're um, going to have a big impact later, right? So sometimes people make a change and they want to feel really good instantly, right? That's kind of what alcohol does for you. It's like, it feels, it feels good instantly, right? But there is profound power in tiny changes. And the example I like to use is a golfing analogy. Even if you don't golf, everybody knows what a golf club looks like and everybody knows who Tiger Woods is, right? And the interesting thing about the head of a golf club is that the difference between somebody like Tiger Woods, who's, you know, ranked very high and somebody who's ranked a hundred, you know, is, I don't even know that guy's name, but is millimeters. It's knowing how to master the millimeters because the change in angle on the golf club head changes, even if it's millimeters, is changes the entire trajectory of the ball. And so being sober is like that too. We are making tiny incremental changes every single day that over time totally changes the trajectory of your life. It's the little things. And it doesn't feel like it because you don't feel the difference, right? But over time, you can. It's it's only when you look in hindsight that you'll see how far you've come. But that's that's what I would ask people to keep in mind is that even though these are small changes, you're you're built like in James Clear's book, The uh, Atomic Habits. You know, your mm-hmm. habit stacking. It's one percent better every single day, and pretty soon you will be in an entirely different space than when you started. Absolutely. Now, I would love to know through your experience of your podcast guests and your in yourself and your own self work. Have you noticed like a trend with spiritual practitioners um, or anyone with natural gifts and not consuming alcohol? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's interesting that alcohol is commonly referred to as spirits. Right. Mm-hmm. It seems to be like a, um, a lot of people believe that it's like you sort of like take on this, this, uh, this spirit, I guess, when you consume alcohol. But what it actually is, is a depressant, right? It actually cuts you off from your ability to perceive because oftentimes there's this idea that the ego speaks first and the ego speaks loudest, right? And it's often that still small voice that is our guiding compass. But Mm. if you are always in crisis mode because of alcohol or always sort of rebounding from the effects of alcohol, it's very difficult to be able to listen to that still small voice. That's our, you know, guiding principle. And I feel like that's how we connect uh, uh, spiritually on a higher plane too. But if we deaden that, you know, I, I don't, it doesn't make sense, right? Does it make sense to you that it, you'd be able to, like you've, you've had experience with this. Uh, what is your experience with being away from alcohol? Well, I have found just as the spirit, a spiritual practice has become more and more popular over the past few years. You know, a lot of people have meditation practice or yoga practice, or they work with hands-on healers or shamans or, you know, dabble with you know, improving their psychic abilities, mediumship, like it's becoming so much more popular. Mm -hmm. I find that most of my friends that I meet that are going in that direction, all ultimately, the last thing to go is wine. And then when wine goes, they realize they become a a better performer in their business, in Mm -hmm. their personal life, Mm -hmm. that they just ultimately choose to abstain. Um, as frequently as possible, unless it's a real special occasion or a special gift. Um, And it's been really interesting to watch because, yeah, yeah, I just, it's, I felt like I took the journey so long ago. It's been really nice to see in a way other people catching up or catching on. Um, And I've gone from feeling so alone to realizing there's so many people like me who just also feel alone. And I think the more we talk about the fact that you can abstain from alcohol and it's not because there's something wrong with you or you had an addiction or you have an addiction, it's just a lifestyle choice Mm -hmm. or it's just a choice for the evening. You know, 
you can say no tonight just because you're not in the mood. You know, it's it's okay. There's nothing wrong with you for it. Um, yeah. And I think, I think, you know, you, you I think for people listening, you can be really comfortable in that moment because the rest of the room isn't going to really analyze whether or not there's something wrong with you and spend the whole night focusing on that. Like, <laughs> You know, and I think about ourselves, let's be honest. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You're really spending the most time thinking about how other people might be thinking about you and they're really not. Nobody's thinking about you. Exactly. If you don't want it tonight or at all anymore, it's completely okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point. I think it's important if you're going into a social setting to be prepared with your answer for why you're not drinking. You know, it could be as like, ah, I'm just not feeling good. It's, you know, I'm, I'm fighting off a little something, something. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd be uh, fighting off uh, handcuffs. <laughs> yeah. know, some people, anyway. I just but, say I'm not in the mood tonight, but most yeah. of the time people don't even ask anymore. I know. Um, you yeah, know, so it's all good. Do you find that like when you get somewhere, like I always tell people to, as soon as you get somewhere, like grab a drink, grab a non-alcoholic drink, and then nobody will offer you anything. And then nobody- I just always have a water in my hand. Yeah. You know, I, I'm someone that, you know, doesn't want the non-alcoholic drink. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm just, I'm just good with the water or the sparkling water, or I ask for a lime or lemon in my drink. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I feel good. And it's one of those things that sometimes when you're having good conversation and when you're in a good space and a good vibe, you can kind of start to feel like a little out of it I or a little, you know, a little dizzy or, you know, just because whether it's other people's energy in the room, yeah. the up spiral of the joy, the music, yeah. you can just start to slowly feel what I, what feels to me a little out of body. Um, mm. To others, it would feel a little drunk. Um, and, you know, all you did was drink your usual water. I, I've had so many experiences. So, so before I was doing this work, I was in a I am from Silicon Valley and I was in high tech sales and all these sales, notorious drinkers, all the salespeople, notorious drinkers. And I would always have like a cranberry soda with a lime and people just assumed I was drinking. And meanwhile, I'd be hanging out with all these, you know, they were always younger than me, like all these young kids and they're all having a great time. We'd stay out till like four in the morning and go get pancakes. And it was like, I'm old. I'm not used to being outside when it's dark. And like, this is amazing. It's so much fun. You just like their energy is infectious. You know, mm-hmm. so you kind of get all the benefits without all the, all the consequences. Exactly. <laughs> and you wake up the next day fresh as a daisy and it's just the absolute best. <laughs> and they're all dragging ass. And I'm like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. It is funny. great. Well, yeah. where do you like to turn to keep learning and, and growing personally and spiritually? Are there oh, any goodness. any things out there that you're really into learning about right now, books you're reading? Yeah, I am an obsessive learner. And I don't know if it, it's just my nature. I'm a helper by nature. So I always consume information with the idea that I'm going to pass it along to someone else. But um, I also like to apply it to my own life. Um, I'm really super into internal family systems therapy right now. I'm doing some trainings myself so I can facilitate, but I also participate as a client and it's such an interesting way to sort of deal with all these parts that we have inside us. And, you know, we, and I say parts like, you know, we might be approaching a project and part of us wants to do it and part of us doesn't you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so we have these polarized parts. And so this process is about checking in to identify what the parts are. Sometimes like they're protector parts and these protector parts are very, I think sometimes they're like distractors or, um, there there's all, there's all kinds, but, um, they're typically protecting a younger part of ourselves that has been wounded in time. And, you know, like when we're growing up and we experience these wounds, you kind of get frozen in time. And so Mm -hmm. that's why, like, there's a lot of talk about being triggered, right. Or whenever we have a, a, a response that's disproportionate to the situation, you walk away, you're like, well, what's that all about? It's because you have a younger part that has, that it's like frozen in time and your protector comes out swinging, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so this is a, a modality of healing that allows you to sort of 
you know, bring this inner child, they call them the exiles, you know, like kind of update them on who you really are and your resources and skills and kind of bring them home and unburden them. And that makes your protectors calm down so that you're really operating from like your higher self. You're not reacting or getting triggered as much. You know, it's really a self-care practice. It's a self-esteem building practice because once you sort of are, um, really responding the way you want to and able to act on the things like goals or things that you need to do. Uh, once you're able to do those in a safe, like emotionally safe, calm manner, um, then it, it starts to engender this idea of like, oh, I'm somebody that can handle hard things. Right. And so anyway, I'm super fascinated. With it. There's like, I'm a podcast junkie. Like I host one, but I also listen to a ton of podcasts. And, but right now I just interviewed a gal that, um, is an IFS facilitator and mm -hmm. it was just really interesting. I, I feel like it's gotten hugely popular lately. Um, oh, so that's currently what I'm obsessed with. <laughs> so interesting. Well, where can people tune into your podcast, learn more about your different offerings? Yeah. So I have a website called soberlifeschool.com and I do offer some courses. I'll be announcing the courses. I, I, lo I love the self-esteem class because I find a lot of times, sometimes the self-esteem issue needs to be addressed before somebody decides to go abstinent, whether they want to be sober or just, you know, some people can moderate. That's never been my experience. <laughs> bless your heart. You can have one or two drinks, but, um, yeah. So sober life school is a main hub. You can get to the podcast that way. It's, it's called the one day at a time recovery podcast. It's on all podcast players. I, um, interview there's, I just released a 302nd episode. <laughs> so it was a yay, but, um, I've had doctors from, you know, you know, Stanford and New York times bestselling authors. And I just interviewed, a. Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert recently, she wrote uh, Eat, Pray, Love. And so that was really cool. So we have some good guests coming up. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And I think I saw that you even had like a Juilliard ballerina recently as well. Yeah. I just published that today. She was, yeah, she was, she was the one who uh, do, now does IFS. She became a psychotherapist and she's like a level three IFS practitioner. And so we, we went deep into her story about how she went from Juilliard to mm -hmm. alcoholic and how she's helping people now. It's pretty amazing. Well, can you leave our listeners with maybe one healthy tip they can consider adding into their life in 2024? Mm, just one. <laughs> you can share more. I mean, I love the tips. Yeah. I would say really think about the three big questions, which is who am I? Uh, what do I want to do? And how do I want to spend my time this year? Mm. Like, who do I want to be this year? What are the attributes? Who do I want? How do I want to spend my time? Who do I want to spend it with? But I think all it all begins with who do I really want to be? That's a, I think that's a great place to start and just allow that to unfold. Thank you. I'm going to reflect on that. That Those are three great questions. I'm asking that question my damn self. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll just like listen to this one part of you asking those questions on a hike over and over again until it becomes clear. Yeah, I know because as we grow and evolve and change and learn, we are different mm -hmm. and what we're capable of changes. And so it's like, wow, what I'm capable of today is so much more than what I was capable of last year. So who am I now? Who do I want to serve? Who do I want to mm -hmm. spend time with? I think those are super fun questions. They are. Well, I'm so grateful that we've connected. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on here. And you're such a great resource for anyone who wants to move into, you know, a lifestyle with less alcohol or no alcohol. So thank you again for sharing. And you guys definitely check out Arlena's podcast. All the links are going to be in the show notes. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.